You're watching Notepad. I'm your host, Ibrahim Sani. We are still in the conversation of how to see and execute and operationalize the revitalization of Malaysia's economy uh, post-lockdown. And I hesitate to say post-COVID because COVID is going to be with us for a long time to come. I hearken your uh, attention back to the interviews that we've done last week uh, with uh, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, with the insurance industry and many others. They are saying that this is here to stay. So now we have to think about how do we work around and revitalize our economy in the realm of COVID. And one such industry that is going to handle this particular conversation quite seriously and have to look into this matter quite seriously is, of course, MHTC. Uh, MHTC is the Malaysia healthcare business uh, industry. And, of course, they are here because they want to address two critical ideas. Number one, the tourism business of Malaysia. And number two, the healthcare business of Malaysia. Joining us is the CEO of uh, MHTC, um, Madam Shireen Azli. Uh, thanks for taking the time to speak with us. Let's uh, do a quick roundup of how MHTC is uh, uh, performing under such trying times right now. Well, thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you for having MHTC here, and I'm Shireen. So, uh, talking about this whole COVID pandemic, I think in general, uh, tourism industry is highly impacted, and we are no ex exception. So, you're talking about medical travel or healthcare travel, medical tourism. This is the industry that Malaysia Healthcare Travel Council is looking after. So when we, before COVID in 2019, we were recording 1.7 billion ringgit revenue to the hospitals and contributing up to 9 billion ringgit into the economy. And if you're looking into the overall uh, tourism receipts, that's representing about 10% of overall Malaysia's tourism receipt. And tourism receipt in Malaysia is uh, third uh, highest contributor to the GDP. So that's significant. And uh, this year when COVID hit, you know, okay, we, we still got patients in the first quarter, but realistically, you know, we are seeing changing, changes in behaviours, we are ch seeing new norms. So we are expecting uh, about 70% dip this year from the level that we were forecasting so this year we were targeting about two billion ringgit in terms of hospital revenue and about 10 billion ringgit contribution to the economy so realistically now we are looking at only about 500 million ringgit contribution to the hospital and two billion ringgit three billion ringgit contribution to the economy so it is a significant hit that we are take uh, we're, we're taking but yeah um, so this yeah. is reported previously about two weeks ago in yes. the media about these um i guess revision downwards mm. of medical tourism revenue but I want to focus a little bit more about uh, the idea of how will this industry move forward under mm. COVID um, the borders are still closed largely speaking but the um, senior uh, minister uh, in charge of defense and of course um, security uh, Datuk Sri Ismail Sabri did say that some industries will reopen uh, in terms of allowing foreigners to come in. Yes. Um, one of them is, of course, medical health care. Uh, this is, um, r has received mixed reviews from the public, largely because they understand what MHCC is trying to do, but mm. they are still concerned about the types of individuals coming into our borders. Could you elucidate some ideas of how to allay the fears mm. uh, that is born out of the idea of foreigners coming into our country and therefore putting ourselves at risk. Yeah, I mean, we, Malaysia has done great in terms of managing COVID. And the last thing we want to do is, uh, you know, open unnecessary risk in terms of uh, bringing in patients into the country without proper protocols. So what we have done is that uh, since the very first MCO, MHTC has, has put together a standard operating procedures, SOP, together with the Ministry of Health, uh, Madris Keselamatan Negara, and all uh, Jabatan Immigration, for example. And we have been working with them in making sure that we have an SOP that will minimise any potential risk when it comes to imported cases into the country. So we are looking at that. So uh, when we put up uh, the pro proposal for for us to be considered medical travel, to be considered as the first uh, sector, business sector to be opened uh, into the uh, to welcome patients in, uh, it was well received because we have had the SOP in place. So the SOP was approved on the 30th of June, and the SOP includes, for example, patients will have to apply to come into Malaysia before, and they have to get that approval from MHTC before they come in. So they have to have the hospitals, uh, you know, registering their uh, their requests. Uh, they have to have to do the 
pre-departure COVID test three days before they, uh, and only they can travel into Malaysia after getting the approval from us and then when they get into Malaysia we have we will be welcoming them from the Aerobridge taking them straight through immigration and straight to our lounges in our uh, airports and then from there they go straight to the hospital so they don't interact with unnecessary uh, you know public um, how would say channels etc they go straight uh, to the hospital they will be subjected to another COVID test and they will be isolated for the 14th day for a 14, 14 days sorry the 14 days in the hospital together with their companion so uh, and then they cannot leave the hospital until the 13th day they do the third test uh, then only they can leave the hospital and they have to leave straight to their home country so they cannot go and roam around and do technically the tourism activities uh, as normal this is to mi minimize the any interaction any exposure that we could have or we could get from an imported case coming well, in the issue here is that sops look good mm -hmm. they are well agreed upon by all parties but when uh, it is executed and done in real life there's some lapses we've seen that a lot um, not just in Malaysia, everywhere around the world. Yes. So what's the story in terms of complying yeah. with the SOP that you guys That's the reason why we only limit to um, hospitals that are registered under MHTC. And then what we do is that we make sure that the hospitals have their own internal policies as well to make sure that, for example, when patients are doing isolation and quarantine, they don't break that, you know, and that kind of thing. So um, with our member hospitals, we have about seven, currently 69 of them, but um, only, uh, I think, about... 11 now are willing to take in the pa patients through the, the tr strict SOP. So we must make sure that uh, the hospitals are ready. We must make sure that you know the uh, machineries are ready along the way. And we, we were very clear that for phase one, patients can only come under medical evacuation, chartered flights or uh, private jets. So technically, they are again not exposed to commercial flights. Only phase two allows them to get, uh, uh, to get on commercial flights uh, that are coming from so-called the green zone countries. So uh, what we are doing is that we are doing this phase by phase in the red, uh, so that we are ready to have a full rebound uh, when the borders fully open. Even then, when the borders are open, uh, we have the phase three deployment, which includes them still following the SOP even when the borders are open. So technically, when you look at all the different SOPs that have been um, set up for foreigners to come into Malaysia, medical travellers are actually the tightest and I think it's actually the most protected group instead of just you know people coming in and doing uh, like like before um, mm. yeah so so okay. that's why i think the comfort and we've got the approval to start receiving patients from the 1st of july mm. and alhamdulillah until now we don't have any of those breaches coming from uh, medical travelers so okay. i think that's very comforting all right, all right. we'll yeah. take one short break before we continue the conversation with mhtc don't go anywhere <laughs> Thanks for staying on with us. Let's talk a little bit more about the Malaysian tourism industry per se, not necessarily healthcare. Mm. Uh, this is one sector that has been severely impacted. We're talking about loss of jobs, businesses, some of which will never ever come back yeah. again. Um, how would the business of healthcare uh, try to salvage um, and save, if I may use the word, in terms of uh, some of the tourism aspect of MHTC's work? Okay. If you look into the overall tourism, I mean, of course, you're talking about uh, there are domestic tourism and international tourism. So let's focus on international tourism that actually brings in the foreign exchange uh, into Malaysia. So out of that, uh, MHTC plays a big role in the sense that uh, medical tourism actually contributes a significant amount. Uh, I told you just now it's about 10% out of the total tourism receipts for the country. And f it's a significant amount for the international tourism as well. So how do we contribute? Actually, one patient, one ringgit that a patient uh, spent in a hospital generates about four ringgit into the economy, uh, you know, for accommodation, um, travel, um, food, shopping, etc. So that's a significant multiplier that's actually contributing uh, how, to how the How did you work this out? Uh, because, for example, uh, there's a study already uh, on this in terms of how the multiplier is calculated that yeah, has been who, done. Who did the study? Uh, not MHTC. It's actually an independent um, 
uh, group in uh, in the region that was that for public was, awareness do yes. they get to yeah you can you can actually pull it out uh, I'll I'll give you the link later if you're interested um, so that one you can pull out no, another I mean, no, thing not later now I mean uh, I, I don't have the, the the link at the moment I'm so sorry. they they who's this body uh, if you if you go into uh, Malaysia uh, our website Malaysia organ uh, sorry uh, MalaysiaHealthcare.org you can download our Malaysia Healthcare Chronicle mm. inside there you can have the details of mm. the of the uh, so studies and everything. So they have for every one ringgit that they spend on the uh, healthcare aspect, four ringgit will be generated yeah. to the economy uh, because of all the ancillary factors. Yes, and also wellness and dental and um, uh, how they uh, wellness tourism. Okay. Uh, and so aesthetics. when you, when you say things like seventy five percent of uh, medical uh, tourism revenue receipt will be revised downwards, we're looking at a significant huge amount of money. That 10% of that total receipt pie uh, of uh, tourism industry, we're going to see maybe just 2 or 3% of the original pie. Is that it? Um, basically, uh, if you're looking at the total target, let's say this year, for tourism earlier, it was $100 billion that they were targeting uh, for 2020. Now, uh, what we, uh, and we were supposed to contribute about $10 billion to it, yeah. but now we are only contributing about 2 to $3 billion only. Yeah, okay. So that's, that's about it. Yeah, right. yeah, so about 2 to 3%. Okay, yeah. While this number is staggering, people are aware. Yeah. Let's talk about how uh, how medical tourism can actually help. Well, this in is the why re revitalization yeah, of the economy. Because if you look at uh, the current situation, if you are uh, going to open up for any tourism at, uh, I mean at the tourists at the moment, it's very risky. So that's why we put in the effort to open medical tourism bubble first. Because you know that they, it's contributing to the economy at the four times, or maybe now less because they can't go shopping freely and everything, maybe about three times. But still, it's actually the multiplier effect is still significant, especially when the patients coming in are not just patients coming in for cough and cold. They're coming in for uh, complex treatment. Mm. Uh, the ones that have come in uh, since 1st July, they're all coming for oncology treatment, mm. uh, cardiology, um, uh, pediatric treatment, and these are actually uh, lengthy, complex treatment. I was about to treatment. say that it's yeah. recurring and yes. it's uh, long-term. Um, sometimes we even palliative care when we talk yeah. about oncology. Well, we, we hope not uh, palliative at the moment because we don't want them to get into uh, the level that if they, they are going to pass on here, I yeah. think that's not that's not what we are looking for. Uh. We are looking for patients who can actually recover yeah. but, by coming But the story is that it's still a long-term yes. care yes. instead of a single job yes. when you're done. Yeah. So then, with that effect, it helps. Uh, uh, jumpstart the tour international tourism because if you wait for the borders to open we don't know when at this juncture and it's probably never I mean, I'm not we, yeah, kidding. we never Let's know not yeah here. so that's the reason why we initiated this whole medical tourism bubble to start first if you don't if you didn't do it uh, uh, you know the, the SOPs and everything then Majlis Kelapatan Negara and even uh, the senior minister himself wouldn't be confident enough to say let's open this up MOH for example our uh, KKM will not say that I agree to your to bring for you to bring in medical travel because it's going to be risking our mm, Malaysians. Mm, mm. So we, we looked at all that and uh, MHTC took that effort to build that SOP so that we know that while we are trying to jumpstart the, the tourism economy, we are also protecting the interest of Malaysia and Malaysians first and foremost. So I think that's where we, we, we sort of, you know, uh, we thought ahead and said, okay, we are going to convince them, let's open medical travel bubble first. For tourism, so at least we're getting that three times, or you know, the four. I don't think we're going to get the four times now in this kind of economy, but at least three times is a lot uh, of uh, in terms of multiplier into the I mean, economy. Look, I mean, yeah. forever, however critical I sound, I'm actually rooting for you guys to work. Thank you right? very That's much. Appreciate idea. that. But there is that risk that yes. um, we, whether or not the opening up any sort of border will put ourselves at risk. Let's talk a little bit about the kind of people that uh, are normally the medical travellers. Prior to starting this interview, I said to you that um, my understanding is that probably it's from the MENA region. Mm -hmm. um, but is my assumption correct? No. Actually, MENA region contributes uh, perhaps you know, if in total they are maybe in the top 10 arrivals you know not individual countries but the main contributor to our uh, in uh, our medical tourist numbers last year 2019 we had about 1.3 million arrivals in 2018 uh, the global market research by Lang Birzon uh, based in UK has recognized Malaysia as the country with the number one volume um, 
for medical travelers. So we are currently ranked number one before COVID. So we are the number one medical travel vet volume. And then out of that, 60% uh, of our arrivals of that 1.3 million are coming from Indonesia. Second is China. And then after that, in, uh, India. And the rest are from um, Southeast Asia and Indochina region. So if you're looking into that, that, out, that region itself, you know, you have India, China, Southeast Asia. Technically, we are nearly half of the world population, target-wise. So, Middle East, uh, while they do come to Malaysia, uh, they they do I mean, they do not make the bulk of it. Partly okay. because of the travel times and everything. I'm sorry, the the countries that you mentioned just now sends a lot of red bells. Mm, you know, for now, yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> Indonesia, China. Yes. H how are we managing that? Okay, that's why currently, if they want to come in, uh, they will have to come in only with medical evacuation, chartered flights or private jets. Yeah, and now we are that. allowing chartered ferry. Which, so that means they don't... Chartered ferry? Yeah, because they don't, uh, they don't uh, get exposed to the commercial uh, transport. Then that's where the risk would be. Uh. And three days before, they will have to test for COVID. When they arrive, uh, MHTC staff will welcome them and take them straight yeah. to to their transport for hospitals. Yeah. So and then they have to do their test again. So that's why we are limit limiting the, the 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 interaction or access or any kind of risk along the way. And our hospitals are the ones who are willing to take uh, that that responsibility to manage those patients. Okay, let's do a quick uh, real time analysis here. Uh, the announcement to allow for medical travelers to come in start on July first. Mm -hmm. um, we're done with July. Are the numbers, were the numbers uh, meeting your expectations? Okay, uh, to be honest, we didn't set it very high because we, it was more of a trial and error for I us to see. Yeah. So uh, we had more, in terms of general inquiries, we had more than thousands. Actually, we had thousands of general inquiries. This is more than you expected? Yeah, yeah. in that sense, we more than we expected for inquiries. Expected okay. for inquiries. But then we, we filtered it because uh, I think many didn't were not clear that they can only come in Via to those chartered, chartered yeah. you know, all yeah. the chartered the medical evacuation, chartered flights, chartered ferry. So then when we, when we mentioned to them that you have to spend, that's where the numbers uh, tapered down to about 200 plus. Then they submitted their applications and currently we have uh, less than 100 already uh, approved because we are also strict in terms of vetting tr through their, their cases. You know, you do, there, are, there are applications coming, they want to do dental, uh, which is not urgent. So we did not put that, we did not approve that, for example. But for those who are coming with, uh, uh, how would I say, legit, uh, uh, treatments required, then we, 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 we what, look what into that. What constitutes like the legit? Leg I mean, like, for example, when talking about oncology, they need to come in for chemotherapy and stuff. For cardiology, maybe certain treatment like uh, like even bypass and stuff like that. Um, for pediatrics, uh, we also get a lot of pediatric cases because they're quite urgent. Otherwise, it can be life-threatening for the child, for sure. example. So those kind of things, we, we actually... Uh, approved to come in. Uh, so, so. Who, so who approves this? Currently, the approval comes from MHTC, from us. Uh, okay. MHTC. Does MOH have any say in this? Uh, yeah, because MOH has approved the uh, procedure. Because MHTC is an agency under the Ministry of Health. Oh, yeah. uh, so MOH has already uh, approved the, what do you call it, the SOP. So now we actually work with our private hospitals that are going to be receiving those patients. And then we work with immigration. So immigration will do the necessary immigration check. And then we will uh, verify the, with the hospitals and everything. Then we will issue the, the approval letter. Are you happy with the July numbers, the actual uh, uh, patients actually, coming? Actually, to be honest, we are quite happy with the quality of patients. Okay. Not so much the numbers. No, the that, that's, of, that's yeah. the way to go yes. moving forward. Yeah, Previously, you patients. were thinking a lot more. Yes, and yeah. I understand. Yeah. But now we've got to be a little more selective. Yes, yeah. uh, so what's the projection like towards the end of the year? So we, uh, that, that's where when it comes to the projection. That's where we are looking at a total of 500 million in terms of revenue. In terms of numbers, we have yet to come to a comfortable level. That's to, my question. To, yeah. So you... You, you don't have a range? For, for now, no, because it's, it's a, it's, again, it's a new norm. There, there's going to be changes in behaviour of people in terms of uh, travelling. Even though they need to travel, they may weigh their, their circumstances. And also, it depends very much in terms of when other countries are willing to allow their, their patients, to, I mean, sorry, their, their citizens. Uh, citizens to travel. So, like, for example, it's even though, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, for example, New Zealand, they, they, they may be no. the, the, the green countries, right? 100 days, yeah. right? That's what they say. Ah, so, they may be the green countries. We may welcome them. But if the country says that, you know, we are not allowing our uh, citizens to travel, then it may not happen immediately. So, to be honest with you, uh, we are more comfortable to, uh, to 
focus on uh, achieving the quality and hence the revenue side of things rather than the number of patients that we used to Let's talk a little bit for. about the tourism healthcare bubble um, per se. Um, if they are isolated, coming in from end-to-end, -end, point to gate of entry, all the way to the hospital, 14 days, um, how, do they, how do they enjoy the tourism aspect of uh, the, the country? Because um, people who are listening to this, if they are healthcare professionals, they might not have a direct stay into how the, op the mm. hospital works. Mm -mm. But there are people in the tourism sector that are watching this show, that's trying to understand what you guys are doing, and they might want to have some form of uh, dip in that two ringgit, three ringgit pie, or even that four ringgit pie mm. that you mentioned just now. How mm. do they get in on the, on the gravy, yeah. I suppose? For now, for phase one, uh, it's going to be very minimal. It's going to be more just a transportation, more more from in terms perhaps uh, not so much tourism, more from the medical evacuation or flights, uh, uh, you know, arrangements and chartered flights, but not so much on the tourism, you know, uh, the fun part of things. It's not uh, not even the shopping part of things, if, oh, yeah. if you ask me. For wow. now, for phase one, but we are already easing into phase two. So technically, is even easing into phase two. I think uh, with the green countries, it gives a little bit more of uh, flexibility, perhaps in terms of. Uh, these patients uh, proc procuring services uh, from tourism. Maybe you can do online shopping and stuff like that. You know, so we, we are looking at utilizing our digital assets to enable those kind of things to come through and reaching to our patients. So uh, actually, that's what we are doing now. Not only uh, talking about the SOP, not only talking about people coming in. What we are doing now is that we are, we are pushing a strong PR and branding. Uh, uh, campaign outside of Malaysia so that and with uh, all this uh, first phase in place already and everything so we build the confidence for people outside to know that Malaysia is a country that can handle COVID pandemic we have been doing very well we are now rated third in Asia Pacific in, uh, prep, uh, in the preparation of handling uh, cancer for example so all these stories are pushing out so that they, the trust level maintains or even uh, gets better Malaysia remains top of mind and they can see that you know patients coming in the first phase in the second phase are well taken care of so it builds the confidence and when we relax our borders this group will come Be in among the first yeah among the first to come in and Malaysia is in their top of mind so that's the main thing so uh, while we do it's a two prong you know you can do the campaign and yet we must make sure that patients come in based on the phases and they are well taken care of and, and treated. At the same time, we deploy full uh, digital assets, looking into telemedicine, uh, teleconsult, uh, e-pharmacy, so that even our patients that are currently not making their travels, they can still access to our doctors, they can still access to their normal medications, etc. Because yeah. that's very important to have that continuum of care. That's the next topic that we're going to talk about right after this break. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> Thanks for staying on with us. I'm with Shireen Azli of MHTC. We're talking about the healthcare business. We're talking about the tourism business. Let's talk a little bit about that um, bit of digitization um, and teleconsulting um, and telehealthcare for that matter um, prior to us going to that break just now. Um, we know now that there's a lot of services, particularly in the healthcare business, it talks about um, online consultation, um, even remote treatment. I've seen one case where uh, the doctor was asking uh, the patient uh, via phone call, via Zoom or whatever, um, on self-care and the medication and all that will be given to that patient via the mail. Mm. Meaning that there is an extensive online care taking place without the doctor being physically there. Two years ago, I went to um, I went to CS in Las Vegas, and they were talking or they were showcasing the the, the marvels of 5G. They were talking about remote surgery because the surgeon was wearing these goggles and these um, gloves, and they were doing mm. this remote surgery. Everybody's like, "Oh, this is cool," but they can't imagine an application of it. Mm. Now you're tying, you know, you're putting two and two together, where health uh, active physician slash surgeon healthcare has to be rendered to the patients and now we have to solve it via virtual means. Is this a reality for Malaysia in the near term? If you look in globally, I think amongst all industry, healthcare is the least disrupted. Uh -huh. Partly because of the nature of the, the, the services itself. Uh -huh. uh, we patients, we still want to see our doctors. 
we want to have that, you know, we want our doctors to check on us and, and, and touch us and stuff like that, you know. So, it, 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 historically, it, we haven't been adopting um, technology very well, other than perhaps robotics and, you know, how you do your surgeries and stuff like that. But uh, very little compared to other industries. So, COVID, had, what, what COVID has done is basically pushing that, you know, yeah, because... Forces everyone, yes, actually. Yes, yeah. You know, you, you know you my need, grandma. <laughs> no, honestly. Yeah, you need yeah. to look at the new ways of doing things. And, uh, you, you know, if you... Like, for our patients abroad, it, it, as much as they may be reluctant, they will have to see how they need to reach out to their doctors. So I think this is where, for us now, uh, we are enabling the platform. We are enabling, we are encouraging our hospitals to get on board. We are encouraging the doctors to open their doors to tele teleconsult, etc. Uh, we are working with uh, pharmac pharmacies to look into e-pharmacies and you know posting the medication through our hospitals, etc. But um, in the end, um, I must say that the take-up rate is not as encouraging because again, people would choose to wait to the time when I can make the trip to go and visit my doctor. I'm sorry, sometimes conditions doesn't allow you yeah, to wait. I mean, if you have an, an engagement yeah. with an oncologist, mm. the cancer is growing. Yeah. So now that's why they, 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 they still, they, are, they prefer, if they have money, they prefer to spend on their medical evacuation or chartered flights or, you know, wow. whatever it takes. Because healthcare is... Rather uh, than digital adoption. It, well, but it, there's only so much... In truth, for healthcare, there's only so much you can do under digital adoption. Oh. Especially when you're having complex uh, cases like, uh. you know, cancer uh. and stuff. I think at the end of the day, uh, we are human and we want someone to care for us and look uh, after us. Yeah. So maybe you can have... The difference is that you may have the uh, the first teleconsult uh, uh, the first consultation through teleconsult. Yeah. The second one, but eventually you really have to make that trip. What about mental yeah. health uh, and also um, um, therapy? Uh, Currently, um, I think this is again, you know, to many countries in this region, it's still a taboo kind of a topic, not for Malaysia necessarily, but other countries. So for them to be talking again uh, on, on digital and stuff like that, it doesn't give that kind of comfort. No way, yes. this is interesting. Uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> that's, that's the reality, Rahim. You know, it's an, an, uh, as much as we want people to adopt it no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not rejecting your information. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, just saying, I'm just, uh, this is yeah. new information yes, for yes. me. Yes, Unfortunately, you know, you, uh, uh, even when the hospitals uh, embarked on the teleconsult and telemedicine, they said, unfortunately, Shireen, our patients are still not taking up the way that we would like them to be. So they're still waiting. The question, they will still come back to the hospital and ask, when are you allowing us to fly yeah, in? Okay. And uh, my, uh, our hotline in uh, MHTC... But that bit bites well for your industry, right? It's I good, mean, the demand good. is insatiable. Yeah. But you must make sure that we also take care of our patients at the same time. And the country. Yeah, and yeah. the country. So I think this is the balance that we are in. Actually, from the very first day of MCO, we, our patients never stop knocking on our do door to come in. Okay. And that's one of the reasons why we sp I told the Ministry of, uh, Motec Ministry of Tourism, yeah. I told them that if you, there's one um, tourism sector that people will, uh, you know, the demand is still there, it, it would be medical tourism because you can't... No, no one's going to dispute that. Yeah. I agree with you. So that's why we, we are preparing ourselves as much as we can to start in phases and, and, and at the same time still deploying our digital assets. Mm. We are doing a lot of health talks. Mm. We are telling them to take, how to take care of themselves, how mm. to uh, take care uh, of themselves uh, against COVID-19. Uh, mm. We are tell, uh, even on mental health. So we're educating our patients uh, across borders. But yeah, it, it, it is, it is um, a challenging process, if I can say that. Well, let's draw this conversation to a close. Uh, how do you think your industry will perform in the next few months? Okay, in the next few months, uh, we, we, uh, as I said, we are looking at nothing more than uh, that 500 million revenue and that 2 3 billion contributing to the economy. But what's more important is what we are doing now to uh, get the recovery next year. Mm. So next year, we are, we are looking at. I'm sorry, you're <laughs> still optimistic yeah. about next year? <laughs> no, technically, that's what we are doing. If we are not looking into next year, uh, reality is this year, we are not expecting people to you know, land in, in, uh, the way, in Malaysia the way they did it before. So we have to prepare for next year. So whatever that we do this year is all about uh, maintaining the continuum of care, um, uh, embarking on a strong PR branding exercise so Malaysia remains top of mind. Uh, sharing them uh, the the how we are prepared uh, for them to come in and for the rebound so these are the three things that we are pushing out now we are doing all we can so that when we relax i'm not saying opening our border when we relax our borders yeah. the patients 
will remember Malaysia is the country for them to come and get their treatment. Fantastic for. way to end the conversation. That yeah. was Shreen Azli of MHTC. If you've missed any part of this interview, just head on to astroawan.com, look for Notepad over there. Plenty of interviews like this can be found on that website. Also, you can watch these kind of interviews on your mobile devices. You download the Astroawan app wherever you get the application. Until next time, thanks very much for watching and goodbye. <coughs>